it says. We passed several sugar plantations, new ones and not very extensive. The crops were in most cases third r ratoons. Note, the first crop is called plant cane. Subsequent crops which spring from the original roots without replanting are called ratoon. Almost everywhere on the island of Hawaii, sugar cane matures in 12 months, both ratoons and plant. And although it ought to be taken off as soon as it tassels, no doubt, it is not absolutely necessary to do it until about four months afterward. In Kona, the average yield of an acre of ground is two tons of sugar, they say. This is only a moderate yield for these islands, but would be astounding for Louisiana and most other sugar-growing countries. The plantations in Kona being on pretty high ground, up among the light and frequent rains, no irrigation whatever is required. Chapter 70 A Droll Character Mrs. Beasley and Her Son Meditations on Turnips A Letter from Horace Greeley An Indigent Rejoiner Rejoinder a letter translated, but too late. We stopped some time at one of the plantations to rest ourselves and refresh the horses. We had a chatty conversation with several gentlemen present, but there was one person, a middle-aged man with, with an absent look in his face, who simply glanced up, gave us good day, and lapsed again into the meditations which our coming had interrupted. The planters whispered us not to ma mind him. Crazy. They said he was in the islands for his health. Was a preacher. His home? Michigan. They said that if he woke up presently and fell to talking about a correspondence which he had sometime held with Mr. Greeley about a trifle of some kind, we must humor him and listen with interest and we must humor his fancy that his, this correspondence was the talk of the world. It was easy to see that he was a gentle creature, and that his madness had nothing vicious in it. He looked pale and a little worn, as if with perplexing thought and anxiety of mind. He sat a long time looking at the floor, and at intervals muttering to himself and nodding his head acquiescingly or shaking it in mild protest. He was lost in his thought or in his memories. We continued our talk with the planters, branching from subject to subject, but at last the word circumstance casually dropped in the course of conversation attracted his attention and brought an eager look into his countenance. He faced about in his chair and said, Circumstance? What circumstance? Ah, I know. I know too well. So you have heard of it too, with a sigh. Well, no matter. All the world has heard of it. All the world. The whole world. It is a large world, too, for a thing to travel so far in. Now, isn't it? Yes, yes. The Greeley correspondence with Erickson has created the saddest and bitterest controversy on both sides of the ocean, and still they keep it up. It makes us famous, but at what sorrowful sacrifice. I was so sorry when I heard that it had caused that bloody and distressful war over there in Italy. It was little comfort to me after so much bloodshed to know that the victors sided with me and the vanquished with Greeley. It is little comfort to know that Horace Greeley is responsible for the Battle of Sadoa and not me. Queen Victoria wrote me that she felt just as I did about it. She said that as much as she was opposed to Greeley and the spirit he showed in the correspondence with me, she would not have had Sadoa happen for hundreds of dollars. I can show you her letter if you would like to see it. But gentlemen, much as you may think you know about that unhappy correspondence, you cannot know the straight of it till you hear it from my lips. It has always been garbled in the journals and even in history. Yes, even in history. Think of it. 
let me, please let me give you the matter exactly as it occurred. I truly will not abuse your confidence. Then he leaned forward, all interest, all earnestness, and told his story, and told it appealingly, too, and yet in the simplest and most unpretentious way, and indeed in such a way as to suggest to one all the time that this was a faithful, honorable witness giving evidence in the sacred interest of justice and under oath. He said, Mrs. Beasley, Mrs. Jackson Beasley, widow of the vi village of Campbellton, Kansas, wrote me about a matter which was near her heart, a matter which many might think trivial, but to her it was a thing of deep concern. I was living in Michigan then, serving in the ministry. She was and is an estimable woman, a woman to whom poverty and hardship have proven incentives to industry in place of discouragements. Her only treasure was her son William, a youth just verging upon manhood, religious, amiable, and sincerely attached to agriculture. He was the widow's comfort and her pride, and so moved by her love for him, she wrote me about a matter, as I have said before, which lay near her heart, because it lay near her boys. She desired me to confer with Mr. Greeley about turnips. Turnips were the dream of her child's young ambition, while other youths were frittering away in frivolous amusements the precious years of budding vigor which God had given them for useful preparation. This boy was patiently enriching his mind with information concerning turnips. The sentiment which he felt toward the turnip was akin to adoration. He could not think of the turnip without emotion. He could not speak of it calmly. He could not contemplate it without exaltation. He could not eat it without shedding tears. All the poetry in his sensitive nature was in sympathy with the gracious vegetable. With the earliest pipe of dawn, he sought his patch, and when the curtaining night drove him from it, he shut himself up with his books and garnered statistics till sleep overcame him. On rainy days, he sat and talked hours together with his mother about turnips. When company came, he made it his loving duty to put aside everything else and converse with them all the day long of his great joy in the turnip. And yet, was this joy rounded and complete? Was there no secret alloy of unhappiness in it? Alas, there was. There was a canker gnawing at his heart. The noblest inspiration of his soul eluded his endeavor. Viz, he could not make of the turnip a climbing vine. Months went by. The bloom forsook his cheek. The fire faded out of his eye. Sightings and abstraction usurped the place. Sighings and abstraction usurped the place of smiles and cheerful converse. But a watchful eye noted these things, and in time a motherly sympathy unsealed the secret. Hence the letter to me. She pleaded for attention. She said her boy was dying by inches. I was a stranger to Mr. Greeley, but what of that? The matter was urgent. I wrote and begged him to solve the difficult problem, if possible, and save the student's life. My interest grew until it partook of the anxiety of the mother. I waited in much suspense. At last the answer came. I found that I could not read it readily, the handwriting being unfamiliar, and my emotions somewhat wrought up. It seemed to refer in part to the boy's case, but chiefly to other and irrelevant matters, such as paving stones, electricity, oysters, and something which I took to be absolution or agrarianism. I could not be certain which. Still, these appeared to be simply casual mentions, nothing more. Friendly in spirit, without doubt, but lacking the connection or coherence necessary to make them useful. I judged that my understanding was affected by my feelings, and so laid the letter away till morning. 
In the morning I read it again, but with difficulty and uncertainty still, for I had lost some little rest and my mental vision seemed clouded. The note was more connected now, but did not meet the emergency it was expected to meet. It was too discursive. It appeared to read as follows, though I was not certain of some of the words. Polygamy dissembles majesty, extracts redeemed polarity, causes hitherto exist, 